Welcome back, everyone. Hopefully you've had a chance to navigate around. Um, don't forget you've got those open sessions and the networking sessions if you want to jump into that. Uh, so this is going to be our first talk. We've got um, Rob Baker here. Um, Rob labels himself Chief Positive Deviant. And I've, I've written this down because there's a lot to add in um, about Rob. So he's an ex-HR director. He's a TEDx speaker, an MBA lecturer, founder of Tailored Thinking and author of the book Personalization at Work. And today he'll be delving into the power of personalizing work and job crafting. So this is um, Rob Baker. So over to you, Rob. Hi, welcome everyone. And really pleased to kind of be speaking to you and someone who I suppose I'm wearing different different hats today. So I'm um, uh, someone who benefits from Stride. So so I use um, your, your services um, to benefit from, from it. Um, but also lovely to contribute and share some ideas today that hopefully and many of you will find useful in terms of your and um, the business that you that you either run or for um the kind of if you're 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 an employee within a business so actually kind of shaping how you do your work so what i'm going to do today in the 50 minutes that we have is i want you to be curious about actually are there things you can do to shape and and personalize your approach to your work to make it a bit more fulfilling more engaging more productive for you and um, so you might be looking to kind of improve your um, your engagement with work, your energy at work, your um, the ability to kind of switch off maybe from from the work that you do to kind of a better balance between your work and uh, personal life. These are things a lot of us are uh, having to to manage at the moment. Uh, if you're an employee, it may be a case of actually saying, "How can I can set up my job and my my the way of working so that it kind of really works for me?" So that these are the things that we want to kind of explore today and we're going to do this through a mix of um powerpoint slides so i'm going to share with you some some, some some slides we're going to do some a whiteboard activity so we'll kind of tangibly look at an activity that we'll do to, to today to that i often work with groups to to, to do that and i'll share with you a, a short video as well at some point and so we'll mix it up and use lots of different and um, different um uh, to, to today's talk. So I'll share my slides with you all and to start with and I'll just click on the right buttons to do this. Okay. So, so we're going to think about how we can create meaningful work through job crafting or how you can create positive work for, you, for yourself. There's loads of, we'll send you the slides to, for Kira and others, you'll get slides from this, from this, just to let you know that I've put, put loads of resources and, re and references out there. If, you, if you're struggling with anything that, that I'm saying or kind of want to learn more about it, then, then please don't hesitate to drop me an email. So I'm really happy for you to just do that through, through any of the Stride team or just Going to email me directly and i think within the slides you'll have my email address in there if you're interested in kind of going much deeper in terms of the topic of job crafting and how this can impact on you and as a business i've um, written written a book about it so personalization at work and this is kind of a real deep dive about actually how you can bring these ideas to life so um depending on what your kind of the, your interest in this space then there's lots of different um material that you can dive into Taylor Thinking, our positive psychology, well-being, and HR uh, consultancy. So we're based in. I'm speaking to you in Durham today, and we are focused on making work better and making better work for individuals, teams, and organisations using behaviour uh, behavior science and positive psychology. And we were delighted last year to be named HR Consultancy of the Year by the CIPD. So the CIPD is the um, the largest professional HR body um, in, in Europe. So it was a really um, delighted for us as a business owner. So I'm the founder of the company. It was something that I was kind of incredibly proud of for quite a young, young organization. I'm on social media. So I'm on Twitter. I'm on um, uh, LinkedIn. Um, do If you're interested in the kind of ideas that I'm sharing with you today, then please do connect and say hello. Um, and you can hopefully find information and resources and articles that you find find useful. So the idea that I'm going to talk to you about today is job crafting. And fundamentally, I want you to think about actually how you can personalize your, your work to make it 
um, better for you as an individual. And we'll explore kind of what that means. So, but I wanted to just give you a bit of a background in terms of where I, I discovered your crafting. And it was actually at the top of this um, building here in Australia. So I was working in, um, in, in Melbourne, in Australia, and I was studying for a master's in positive psychology as I was doing this. And I was in a lecture um, delivered by um, uh, a lecturer called Dr. Gavin Slem, and he studies positive organizational scholarship. So he studies how teams, organizations, and individuals can perform optimally from a work perspective. And he was giving a presentation about different things. And there's one that really stood out to me. And he was referring to the fact that this was a, a concept, an idea that had been studied for over 15 years at the time, and had been subject to over 100 kind of academic rigorous studies. And these showed things such as outcomes when it came to well-being, when it came to performance, when it came to career satisfaction and growth. This, this, this concept was related to all of this. And this concept was job crafting, which is going to be the focus of this session. And pretty much once I heard about this idea, I kind of ran out from that lecture thinking, how can I bring this to life within organizations? And pretty much the last six, um, six or seven years, that's what I've been doing as a consultant and working with teams and individuals to bring this concept to life. And when I talk about job crafting, what I'm talking about is actually personalizing and customizing your approach to work. So you can think about it um, a bit like um, a semi-tailored suit. So this image I took in Newcastle from Moss Brothers, if someone can maybe pick up the, um, the label. I nearly got thrown out of the shop when I took this picture um, by the security guard, but luckily I managed to get it before they, before they threw me out. And this, this, this badge, I think, really nicely sums up job crafting. So many of us listening to this will have a, a kind of a job of a role that you have and there's lots of different tasks and activities within that and you can't just drop doing them you've got lots of different balls you're having to juggle there's lots of um of tasks and activities you have to do yeah what you can maybe do is think about actually how can you customize and think about how you how you um think about those tasks how you deal with those tasks how you um how you kind of um find ways to kind of shape those tasks in ways that bring out your strengths, your passions, your interests. And we'll talk about this in a bit more detail later on. But this, this, this label was around a, a suit jacket and it said, tailor me to make me more you. So it was describing the fact that you could change the dimensions of this jacket to make it a better, more comfortable, better looking fit for you as an individual. You, will, you couldn't change the fabric of the jacket. You couldn't change the overall style. And but you could change the kind of dimensions of it to make it a better fit. And job crafting is effectively saying, how can you do that to your job? How can you do that to the any employees' jobs that work, you know, work within within your businesses? So it's around saying you can't, you're not asking people to radically redesign their job, but what you are doing is saying, are there ways that you can find to make your job a bit better for you as an, an individual so that you're you're more likely to be engaged and fulfilled and interested in what you're doing and very seldom do we create opportunities for ourselves to actually reflect on on how we do how we do our work so what i would like to do in the in the 50 minutes or the 40 minutes we have now is to kind of explain why we should personalize work a little bit more about job crafting i'm going to talk about how we can kind of um do an exercise about job crafting. I'll mention a little bit how I've done this with an organization, Connect Health, and then we'll have some, some opportunities for some questions on the chat. So I know that we're not seeing videos, but, but please do put questions on the, on the messaging board as you want or comments. Um, I won't be able to kind of monitor all those as we're, as we're talking, but maybe Kieran or someone else on the, on, the, on the team, if you see something that's burning an issue, then, then please just come off mic and, um, and raise it. So why should we be personalizing our work why should i we should be actually stopping to to think about actually how do we do our jobs how do we run our businesses and are there ways for us to make it and um, so that they um, there are ways that we find more fulfilling more interesting and and they give us more energy rather than take away for a lot of us will find that we are kind of struggling for energy at some points with the, with the work that we're doing so when you think about it, we can personalize pretty much any and every aspect of our lives, from our cars, to our clothes, to our coffee shops, and um, to our cups of coffee. We can even personalize our jars of Marmite. This is a jar of Marmite I mocked up because you, you could change the label of it to say work is fab. And so pretty much any and every aspect of our life around us, we can, we can personalize. Yet we don't often get encouraged to personalize or think about our work. For many of us, our work is is pretty fixed. Um, we've kind of got key tasks and activities that we need to do, and we just get on and do them. 
yeah, we don't think about actually other ways of us personalizing those tasks in terms of how we approach and, and do them. We know that when we personalize our goods and services, we tend to value them more and, and we have greater engagement with them. And so again, there's no reason why those same ideas can't apply to the workplace. And I want to share with you two different studies that I think kind of relate to this um, uh, kind of nicely. So the first relates to IKEA. So I, I appreciate that you wouldn't necessarily thought you'd be coming to IKEA today when we're, we're speaking to us. And I think this is a really important idea, particularly if you're building your business and involving other people. This is a really important idea. So this study was done by um, Mike Norton and colleagues from Harvard Business School. And they got two groups of participants to come along uh, to um, to be involved in a, an experiment. The first group, they were asked to build um, from a flat pack kit, the stationary boxes that you, you can see on the left-hand side. So they actually asked them to manufacture, to build these things, to, to about 10 minutes to do it. Then they asked them to, um, to, to, um, put a, to put a bid on, uh, not a bid, so to place a value on these, to say, how much do you think these are worth? Um, the second group, they came along and they, they the boxes had already been made for them, potentially by the first group, who knows, but the, the, the boxes had already been made for them. So they didn't have to build them. They just got to inspect them. And then they asked them to um, put, again, put a, a value on those in terms of who, how, how much they thought this was, the, um, these cost. And there was a significant difference between these two groups in terms of who valued them the most. The builders built them and then they valued, and then they were asked to value them. The inspectors were given the box and then asked to value them. Who um, who do you think valued them the most? So if you can put an I or for inspectors or a B for builders in the chat function, I'd like to see your guesses in terms of who valued these the most. And I can see your um, answers in the in the chat. So Kieran's got us off with one answer. I'd like to hear from, from others as well. So thanks, Duncan. Louise is saying B as well. So George, Matt, Joanne, all B so far. And okay, so you're, everyone has put B, you're completely right. So well done, you give yourself a gold star. I haven't got gold stars, I would give them to you if I had them, but I haven't, unfortunately. So the you're absolutely right. So the people who built these, who, who feel that they could, um, Lisa, I don't know if you were, have I given you the answer or, you, or we just took some time to, to come through, but you're right as well. So the people who built um, the boxes valued them more. So having your fingerprints and your involvement in terms of creating a solution means that you're more likely to engage with it. Now, this is actually counterintuitive because you have to do more work. The people who built them spent an extra 10 to 15 minutes with that product than the people who, who didn't, who had just given it to them. So many of us often build solutions for other people and give it to them, thinking that we're doing them a favor by and doing work on their behalf yet actually the evidence suggests the opposite when we enable people to feel that their fingerprints are on something they co-create something or contribute to something they tend to value it more so when you're building a business when you're um involving other people in things it could be tempting for you as a business owner uh, to to make decisions on other people's behalf and there's nothing wrong with doing that but the research tends to suggest that actually if you involve other people in these things, they might tend to, to value the end outcome a little bit more than if you just made that decision for them. And when it comes to your job, if you feel that you've had an opportunity to shape and build elements of your job, to create it, to personalize it in some ways, you'll tend to value your job and um, more significantly than if you were just given your job a list of tasks to do and just get on with it. If you have the opportunity to have a conversation about what are the elements of your job you enjoy doing the most, are there ways of you can do more of that or other ways you can expand and grow your job what would that look like if you personalize you tend to value it more the second study involves pens and um, again these are done by university students this was a study in um, uh, vienna business school and miami business school it was a joint study and they asked two groups of participants again to well um, they either split the experiments two groups so the first everyone they asked to, to design a pen to advertise the university that they were going to use for marketing so they asked all the students to say can you use some standard software to design a logo and a pen that we will give out to alumni and or people at um, uh, conferences about advertising the university so they used some standard software to do that and they said can you come back a week later to just test the to see what you like of the final print 
and also to test the, the, the quality of the pen itself to see if it writes nicely, et cetera. So they asked, everyone came back a week, a week later, half the participants were given the pen that they designed and the other half were saying, I'm really sorry, there's a problem with the pen. Um, here's a pen that someone else has designed. Um, you can just test it for the kind of quality of the penmanship. And the way that they asked them to, to, to test the, the quality of the ink, of the design, of the, of the manufacture of the pen was to do some, some puzzles on, on, a, on a page. So there were some anagram tasks and some other puzzles. What they didn't know, the participants didn't know, is that the actual the researchers were interested in measuring how long people spent doing these puzzles and how much, how accurate they were in the puzzles. So they found that the people who had were using the pen that they had designed themselves, so had their logo on it, spent twice as much time actually doing these puzzles compared with those who've just been asked to test the pen that someone else had done. And they were more accurate on the puzzles too. So again, the people are personal, using something, the personalized product that they personalized, they were more engaged with the task that they were using it, but they were actually better performing too. And this applies to sports aspects as well. So we see people wearing personalized equipment and we know from, again, from research that people who are using personalized sporting goods not only feel good about it, kind of maybe a, a personalized putter or football boots or shirt or, or whatever you might see someone using, but they tend to perform better too. And this again applies to the workplace. When we encourage people to personalize their jobs, personalize their approach to work, rather than just doing a task, an activity that someone else has given to them, they tend to perform better, but they tend to be more engaged and interested in what's happening as well. And so the takeaway message from, from this is that people kind of highlight the things they're given, but they tend to value the things that they, they build if they've had an opportunity to co-create something with them. And they love the things that they create. So as a business owner for, or from this, in terms of um, you're listening to this, what I would just encourage you to think about is around to what extent do you create the time to allow other people to help contribute to, to the decisions that you make, the way forward that you're making. Now, that, I'm not saying you have to involve everyone all the time, but it's just something to be bear in mind is the fact that people are probably like to be more engaged with your, with the outcomes of the decisions that you make, or maybe the way that you um, you design the solution to, to an approach, um, if they've been able to contribute to that in some way. So let's think about how we can bring this personalization approach to the workplace. And we can do this through a concept called job crafting. So job crafting enables us to bring our whole, our best, our diverse selves to the work each day. So rather than ignoring the fact that we're all different, we have, all of us um, are unique in the fact that we all have differences as, as humans, job crafting is actually kind of taps into that, our differences, our different experiences, our different strengths, our different approaches. So rather than saying our differences are a bit of a, a frustration, something that we have to kind of work around, actually job crafting is saying, well, actually, maybe there's a way of us was channeling this so that we can all benefit from our individual differences and experiences that we have. And this was a quote from a, an organization that I worked with um, recently who would to introduce job crafting more deliberately with their colleagues. They encourage people to craft their jobs. And part of the feedback that we got was someone was saying, it's great to know that I'm not just um, seen here as a, as a cog in the machine effectively, but you see me as an individual. And fundamentally, as humans, really that's all we want in this place as a planet is to be seen, to be recognized, and to be valued as, as human beings. And job crafting enc encourages people to, to do that. The, the study, and I won't go into too much of the, the research behind this, but the um, the study was, um, well, job crafting was first coined in 2001 by two researchers, Amy Vinisky and Jane Dutton, Dutton. And they were doing a study of um, people working in university hospitals. And they were looking at people with engagement levels of people, how interested and in happy they were with the work. And they, they were really interested to find that a couple of groups of um, uh, professions where the job was pretty much exactly the same, they had very different levels of satisfaction amongst employees. So one of the groups that they decided to study further was cleaners. And they found that actually, although the, the cleaners, the job was very similar, they found that the employees actually rated the, the satisfaction engagement of the job very differently. So they interviewed these individuals to see if they could understand why. 
they asked them to start with saying, why, why do you do the job that you, that you do? And people describe their job very differently. So one group said that they, they're very menial, low status, very physically challenging job. Um, where they're kind of just basically mopping things up, cleaning things and not very well paid, not very well respected. No guessing where they sat on this engagement score. And yet there was another group that were saying, actually, what we do is actually create a sterile and healthy environment for people, for patients to recover. And that's fundamental to recovery. If um, the, the environment isn't sterile, if it's not clean, then people will pick up bugs and it'll have an impact on their ability to recuperate. And so they were interested about that. And these individuals scored more highly on their engagement scores. So they, asked, they, asked, they asked them to say, what else do you do in your job? Are there other ways that you do your job differently to reflect this? And they found that they did. They found that people who felt that their, their, their work was more meaningful and purposeful because they were helping other people would find ways to reflect this in their day-to-day -day activity. So someone, one clean described the fact that they were looking for uh, opportunities to spot someone who looked maybe you sad that day and they would try and make eye contact with three or four different patients to kind of make them smile, to make them be seen. They also, one, one cleaner said they love to kind of help um, lost family members try and navigate the, the, um, the, the hospital corridors and get lost. And one person was saying they'd often go walk people back to the car park to make sure they got them there safely. Another cleaner described moving the paintings and, and or the pictures on the wall as they were cleaning them to create a more stimulating environment for their colleagues. So these are really small things that these individuals were doing and it didn't take much time. It took them maybe five to 10 minutes a day to do these kind of things, they're very small, small activities, but they were very powerful for these individuals because it reflected operating in a way that mattered to them. So if you're listening to this and you are say, someone who works on, um, accounts in terms of the work that you're doing in terms of the um, uh, a lot of that work is I imagine maybe quite transactional in nature so in terms of actually you could see your job as being just doing reconciling things and spotting problems and filing issues and very kind of transactional or you could actually think about the and have create opportunities to connect with the customers that you serve and think about actually what I'm doing here is helping small businesses to to thrive to providing expert advice and support to people to make it easier for them to manage their work in a more sustainable way. So actually what you're doing is not just providing accountancy support, but you're providing support to businesses to, um, to thrive in a sustainable way, to make um, complex issues easy for them to navigate. Again, this is a mindset thing, and it's a, not just a trick of the mind. You can't force it. You can't force someone to think about it this way. But what you can do is create opportunities for yourself and for your colleagues to maybe ha think about how they impact on other people and the wider work they do. And then think about other small ways you can maybe change your job to do, to do more of the things that matter to you. I'm just going to share with you a little video that I think comes, brings, shows job crafting um, to life. I'm just going to tee this, make sure it's set up all right so it is so i'm just going to share this video and hopefully you can all see that if you can't kieran you can just jump off and let me know and i'm going to play the audio for you as well. So just shout, Kieran, if you can't see this, I'm assuming you can. When David Holmes used to give the pre-flight instructions, the passengers would tune out and glaze over. Not anymore. We're gonna shake things up a little bit. I take them by surprise. Uh, I usually don't tell them that I'm gonna do it. And to do it. You guys with me? All right. So give me a stomp, clap, stomp, clap. David needs a little audience participation to pull it off. There you go. Keep that going. This is my 372 on SWA. The flight attendant's on board serving you today. Teresa in the middle. David in the back. My name is David and I'm here to tell you that. Uh, the first time I did it, it's really just because it's just a fun thing to do. If you have a seat on the road with the exit, we're going to talk to you. So you might as well accept it. You got to help us evacuate in case we need you. If you don't want to, then we're going to reseat you. And I didn't know how they were going to react, but I was in a good mood and I like to have fun at work. But then people started getting off the plane telling me, that's the first time I ever listened to the emergency instructions. Before we leave, 
our advice is put away your electronic devices. Fasten your seatbelt, then put your trays up, press the button to make the seatbelt raise up. David was discovered by a passenger who recorded his rap on her cell phone and said she was going to put it on YouTube. And I said, I dare you. And two days later, she did it. And two days after that, it was already over 2,000 hits at the time. Now David is a YouTube sensation. And he's been doing the rap ever since to rave reviews. Sit back, relax, have a good time. I've never experienced a rap in flight attendant. It's pretty awesome. It's pretty easy. And I don't like rap, and I really like that. That was pretty good. Thank you for the fact that I wasn't ignored. This is Southwest Airlines. Welcome aboard. Woo. And so I'm not expecting you to think about how you can rap your role to do that. Although Kieran, you might want to uh, to think about doing a rap later on today that other people can pressure Kieran to, to do that. But what I do like about this this um, video is that it shows a number of different kind of attributes of job crafting that I see when I work with organizations and with, with individuals and teams. So I'll share these um, with you. So Are you okay? So, the common characteristics when I'm encouraging people to personalize your job to find ways to make it more you. <clears throat> what the number one thing is to make it personal to you. So, you can't force someone to say, This is how you should craft your job. So, in David's example, he was saying, Rapping is something he did. He's something that he's good at, obviously he enjoys doing. So it was very personal to him in the way that he personalized his job. So number one for job crafting is it it's personal. You can't force this on someone. Second is it's very it's experimental. So often when you're crafting your job, you don't know what the outcome is going to be. So it's rather than focusing on these changes saying, I'm going to do this because I know what the outcome will be. What job crafting encourages you to do is be a bit curious and a bit experimental, try things in your job, change things up a bit, do things differently and learn from that. So David was saying, I didn't know what was going to happen. I thought I would just try it one day. It was spontaneous. The third element that is, is important when it comes to job crafting is thinking about a small change you can make. So it's around actually, um, it's not big changes, not kind of ripping up your job descriptions and starting and changing your role completely. It's about finding small things. The cleaning examples I gave to you were things that took maybe five, 10 minutes a day. In this example, David would have had to done the fight and announcement anyway, so it cost him no time, but it was just a tiny, small change. So that's when we look at job crafting in practice, most people do it in ways that maybe take five to 10 minutes a day or an hour a week. It doesn't have to be big. And in fact, the smaller it is, the more significant and the more powerful it is. And then lastly, often when we encourage people to job craft, they have unexpected outcomes. So in this instance, David was saying, people were telling me not only they like it, but they actually listened to what I was saying and they don't normally. So they didn't, that wasn't why he did it, but that was an, an outcome from it. And um, I did some work recently with a, um, a, a kind of a, a senior leadership team. And one of the things that they were, they were looking at saying was important to them was connecting and building relationships with their colleagues. Yeah, they, they spent a lot of time with people in meetings, but they didn't actually have the time to connect with people. So they would find once a day, they'd try and have a more of an informal chat with a team member. So either do that in person or through a video chat or pick up the phone and just have these conversations. And what they found is that every time they did that, they felt a bit more in control of their day. They felt better because they were operating and working in a way that mattered to them. But they, a month or so later, one of their colleagues came up to them and said, we've noticed that you've been kind of um, more visible. You've been connecting with people more. Is that a deliberate thing you've been doing? And it was kind of deliberate in the fact that they were doing it for themselves because they wanted to connect with their colleagues, but they, they weren't expecting it to be noticed by their colleagues you know, so actively, so visibly, yet it was. So they were very surprised by that outcome. Another example of this recently is someone was saying they wanted to, they used to have walking meetings for, from a well-being perspective. They wanted to get more energy in terms of their their, their day to create more um, physicality in what they're doing. It was a very sedentary job. So they used to, in the office building, they used to go for a walk around the block with a their, with their colleague for a chat. So what they decided to do in experimental ways, they put their headphones on, phone the colleague up and they both had virtual walking meetings so both of them would be talking to each other but they would both be walking around their streets around by their houses 
And the reason for doing that was to kind of get more exercise. But the unexpected outcome of that was that they found the conversation more engaging. They, they came up with some better ideas. They had a better sense of connection with their colleague because they were listening to what they were saying. They were away from their, their screens. So again, that was an unexpected outcome. And I just want you to recognize there's loads of benefit of just you being curious and changing things up in terms of how you do your, your job. Now, some of you may be saying, I've done this before. I'm kind of very proactive. Or you might know people who are constantly shaving and uh, shave shaving. You're constantly shaping and shifting and improving the way that you, you do your work. You might be doing very proactive, but there's a difference between being proactive and job crafting. So if you were to see two runners on the street going past you, um, one of those runners could just be running for exercise or because they enjoy doing it. And there's nothing wrong with that at all, but that's what they're doing. They'll get all the benefits of that exercise, feeling good, um, kind of maybe managing their weight, um, kind of um, having more energy, all that stuff they would have. Yet another runner who would look identical, running past maybe the exact same pace, they may be running for all those reasons, but they might have an additional purpose. They might be training for couch to 5K. They might be training specifically to as part of a weight kind of um, and lost kind of regime, or they may be training for a half marathon or something. So they will have an additional purpose to, to why they're running. And so when it comes to job crafting, some people are naturally proactive and will find ways to shift and change their job. It's part of kind of how they are and what they do. And that's, that's great, there's positive benefits from that. But being job crafting is kind of going beyond that. It's around being proactive with a purpose. So it's around being deliberate in terms of how you, you do that. So it's around actually saying, I'm going to be proactive because I want to make this more personal to me, to make this job better because it pulls on my particular strength and my interest in helping my customers or something that matters to you. So it's not just being proactive, it's about being proactive with a purpose or being deliberate. So that's the distinction between the, between those two aspects. I'm not gonna go into some masses of detail, but this is, I think, just a useful framework I find for kind of exploring job crafting. So the green center of this is the why of job crafting. Why does job crafting matter? And it's linked to thriving. So people have high levels of well-being. It buffers stress and anxiety when we're feeling we're in control of our jobs. It's linked to performance. Not only do, you, do individuals who job craft rate their own um, performance levels higher, but their team managers do as well, and even customers and report high levels of um, satisfaction with the people who are serving them if the people who are serving them actually job craft, the research has found, which is quite interesting. It's also linked to career growth and satisfaction. So people who job craft tend to be more happy with their jobs, more satisfied, um, and they tend to progress further as well. So that's the kind of why, why does it matter? So again, for the business, if you're interested in your, your people performing well, or you're interested in yourself performing well, you've been engaged with doing, I'd say job crafting is something you should be you should be interested about, curious about. The next layer is around the, the, the what of job crafting. So how do people job craft? People job crafting in lots of different ways. There's lots of different shapes and sizes. They tend to do it in one of five motivations, five ways. So one's changing your tasks, your activities. The second is around looking at your skills. Um, so developing new skills, um, refining your skills in an area. The third is connecting to the purpose and meaning of your job. And um, so it may be a kind of understanding why, why are you doing the job that you're doing and, and, exp and exploring that, the impact you're having on other people. The fourth element relates to your relationships. So it's around how are you connecting with um, people around you? That could be your colleagues, that could be your customers. It could be around amplifying those relationships, building on those relationships, or even reducing or changing those relationships if they aren't working for you. And the fifth element is it relates to well-being. So this is around finding ways to make your job healthier from a mental or physical perspective and changing your work. So the example I gave of the people doing their walking meeting was that it was driven by a job, a well-being crafting goal. They wanted to create more activity in their job. That's why they were doing what they were doing, but they were actually also changing their tasks and they were building their relationships with their colleagues, but that wasn't the kind of primary purpose for it. So when I'm encouraging people to, to job craft, I get people to think about kind of why are you doing it? Think about one of those five different ways of doing it. And then lastly, the, the how of job, how can you do this? It's around creating time and energy and opportunities for you to think about what do you do? How do you do it? Who do you interact with? Where do you do it? And why do you do it? So all those kind of questions, it's creating the space to, 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 to do that and thinking about based on that information, are there ways that you can improve your job? And we'll go through an exercise in a second to do this. So hopefully that makes, makes sense to, makes sense to people um and what we'll do actually is i will jump to 
a love and loathe activity to to show it to to you and i'll just pause at this stage in terms of if anyone's got any specific questions about the things that i've shared with you so far before i before i move on to um the love and loathe exercise so i'll just look at the um the notes if anyone's got any questions and I oh, no. hi i've jumped in thanks this is really good i've actually got one question which i think is probably yeah. as business leaders lots will be thinking about obviously you've talked about personalization here as quite a um you know it's, it's very personal um a lot of people might have read the book the e-myth yes in the kind of kind of scalability of businesses the efficiency of sort of rep repeating tasks and those sorts of things um i'll jump off and drop my camera but i just thought maybe that would be a worthwhile question asking like how do you do you think they're you know they they, they they contradict each other or do you think they can work side by side so i think there's something in terms of efficiencies and effectiveness there's nothing wrong with that there's an approach as approach and standardization of things but there is potentially a cost associated with that as well in terms of engaged difficult to be engaged in so is engaged and is involved in something that's very just kind of very very efficient where you're not having the opportunity to to connect with um with other people and often when there is people concerned about job crafting they're saying actually this is going to make people less um less efficient less effective they're going to they're going to craft ways that's going to impact on their business and yet that doesn't happen in practice the 99 percent of time when i've seen this you know, through the literally nearly thousands of examples when i've collected this but also backed up by evidence shows that people tend to um craft in positive proactive and um responsible ways so they don't do it in ways that actually create hurdles or inefficiencies of business they will do it in ways that, that create positive things and again this doesn't have to be big it can be 10 to 15 minutes a day so it's quite small so i would say it doesn't stop you from being transactional it doesn't stop you from being looking at building efficiencies um, and maybe what it can do in terms of doing those it frees opportunities up for people to develop the roles in different in different ways as well so in terms of the so i wouldn't say anything against those those kind of elements at all and job crafting um, but i would be i just encourage you to think about if you're asking someone to do something that is just purely transactional and it's they don't feel that they've had the opportunity to kind of contribute to those or personalize how that their activity that works done or recognize the benefit of it they're probably not going to be as engaged in that task and as a consequence of that they may not last very long in that role there might be turnover or, or there might be other costs yet there may be ways of tapping into that person's strengths in different ways to the business so that's just something i'd mention mention about that i'm just going to share with you um just this slide from a love and loathe exercise and we're going to do it on screen and but i think it's useful to to see it so so this is an activity that i do with people you can do it in teams you can do it individually and it's around actually thinking about what are the tasks what are the kind of key tasks you do so often i start to get people to think about write down some post-it notes you can do this physically we can do it virtually as we will in a second just write down 10 to 15 different kind of core activities that you that you do and, and then plot them on this graph. So on the bottom of this graph is things that drain you of energy. And on the right hand side are things that give you energy. Um, and what you could be interested from from a job crafting perspective is that are there things you're spending a lot of time doing that drain your energy that you feel really kind of dull or boring or really exhausting or taxing that you just don't like doing? And are there ways of reframing, changing those or reducing those things? Or similarly, are there things that you love doing that you're not spending a lot of time doing? And as a business owner, and um, again, we're working with employees. It would be really fascinating to understand from your employees what are the elements of their job that they enjoy doing and don't enjoy doing. And if there's lots of things that people just hate doing, are there ways of actually taking them away from the business, reframing them some way, or, or at least understanding why you're doing it so that people understand why it's critical that you do certain functional tasks rather than feeling they're doing something without understanding that understanding why. So I'm going to ask you all to think about this, um, and I'm going to. Um, share a, a screen i'm going to share a link with you on the in the chat function so you'll see that in the coming up in the chat in a second so hopefully people can see that and you can click on that link now and um, but don't do anything yet and um, please and i will
share this link with you now. So I've shared a link with you and you'll see this time and energy aspect. And what I'd like you to do is put two post-it notes up because we'll just do it to start with to see how it feels. So if you look at my screen at the moment, the hop-in screen, on the left-hand side, you can see I can pick up a sticky note. So you can see on the left-hand side, you click on sticky note, you choose a color, and then you just simply put it down on the board. So I'd like you to think about what's one thing that you do that drains you of energy. So for me, it's back-to-back um, -back Zoom meetings. That's something that that so I spend quite a bit of time doing at the moment. It drains me of energy. So I need to think about ways I can improve or do things differently. And I'd like you to also add something on the right hand side about something that gives you energy. So um, what's something in your task that, that you do that gives you energy? And just just put so just put two things down on either thing. So use sticky notes to do this. Um, if you're struggling to do this, just put something, put a note on the chat and I can monitor that as well because um, I can't see anyone putting some post-it notes on the left-hand side of the screen. is your sticky note, scroll onto that, and then you can put on, great, so people are starting to put these things on um, now. And this is just an, a simple activity that you can do with your team and colleagues to actually understand kind of where they are about different tasks and activities. It's not saying you necessarily have to change things. People are sometimes worried about asking this stuff in case they can't um, have a solution to it. Yet, yet I'd argue you're better off knowing about it and saying, look, I'm sorry, I don't know the best way of, of solving that at the moment, but I'm, I'm gonna try and do my best to find a way of doing it rather than just it being unsaid and maybe festering for an individual if it's something they hate, if they hate, if they hate doing. You might also find and this often happens when you do this as a team. So you can do this as a team activity that people, um, there might be some people on the team who love doing certain things and other people that hate doing the same tasks. And actually then you might be able to reallocate your tasks somehow. So that some people are saying, actually, if you love doing, I've seen sales presentations, if you love doing pitches and presentations to people, to organizations, then maybe we can find a more opportunities for you to do this. Yet similarly, if you absolutely hate doing that, but you're really happy to put together kind of slide decks or presentations to, to individual pitch decks, then maybe that's where you should be spending your, your time. So it gives you the opportunity to reflect on the different tasks you're doing and potentially boost them. So I'm just seeing things that people drain them energy, monthly billing, admin, emails, yeah, I, that I can relate. I'm nodding my head to a lot of these things. Um, negative interactions, yeah. So a lot of the time that, that could be in terms of dealing with problems or complaints. Um, a nice hack for emails that I find is that I tend to do it in batches now. I'm quite playful with my emails. So rather than have them all, all the time, I will kind of go in and say, right, I'm going to do half an hour of emails now and just dive into the emails for that half an hour and just see how many I can get done in that half an hour. So I set an alarm clock. It could be 15 minutes or 20 minutes, but I do that in a really focused way rather than just constantly snacking on, on emails during the day, which I find just gets in the way of me of my kind of flow and productivity. You may not be able to do that if, if you if responding to email all the time is your is your focus. Yet many of us can probably dive into emails like three or four times during the day for 20 minutes, 50 minutes at a time. Team day speaking to Kieran. Oh, well done, Kieran. You're getting a shout out. I assume you didn't put that on there yourself, Kieran. Um because that would be worrying and um, speaking to yourself, but um who knows? Um uh, but being able to connect with other people, speaking to certain colleagues is something that can lift us lift us up. So just from this exercise, and normally I'd encourage you, you could say you could do this as a team or spend half an hour doing this, mapping things out. What the next stage, and I'll share with you in a second, is then think about what are the things you can do to kind of do a bit more of this. So what are the things you can do to maybe reframe and change the things that you um you don't enjoy doing that drain you of energy and what are the things potentially you could do to kind of amplify and do a little bit more of that um, fills you with energy. And again, we're looking for small things here that take five to 10 minutes a day or an hour a week. So if I was to go back into my slides now, I'll just get that on as you're continuing to. So, oh, this has gone interesting. So that's not worked. Hang on. I will. Try this again.
yeah, that's better. So what I encourage people to, to do is an exercise. And again, you can do this as, a, as a, another, another activity, um, either based on the love and loathe, or you can do it independently. You can just go through each of these five different aspects and saying, what elements of your job would you like to grow, to add to or promote? What would you like to do a bit more of? What are the aspects of your job that you would like to take away, reduce or prevent? So what are the things you'd like to kind of dial down? So this is like an equalizer. If you had these and I had them in the kind of 80s that you could kind of play with your kind of and the different dials to get the perfect balance for you. What if you were designing your perfect job, what are the things ideally you'd like to boost? What are the things you'd like to reduce? What are the things that you'd like to kind of improve and change? And um, what are the things you'd love to keep you kind of want to keep as they are that's working really well for you and you don't, you don't want to touch and what are the things actually you want to stop doing and resisting and pausing and again you can have a really rich conversation or reflection by yourself or with a colleague and just just ask them those those five different areas to think about one aspect of their job they'd like to kind of grow reduce change keep them stop another another reason for doing job crafting and not just support the individual but as a business we all need to continue to innovate. We need to continuously improve. We need to do things differently. And if we're always doing our job in exactly the same way, we're unlikely to innovate and to develop and to improve. And so as a consequence, um, job crafting, asking these types of conversations encourages people to shape and change and improve their job. And by, by definition, by improving their job, will improve your job as a business and the and support that you provide to other people. And um, in a way that, that benefits them, benefits your colleagues and benefits your, your customers. And, and we can't stand still as a business. The, the last 12 months will show us, if nothing else, we have to evolve, constantly evolve and do things differently. And job crafting is a framework, as a way of, of, of bringing this to life, of doing it. And so I just want to kind of end with you with um, a couple of kind of guiding thoughts and kind of guiding principles. Um, that, that I'd like to just share. And from my perspective, we should be kind of creating and crafting freedom and flexibility in, in our work rather than being fixed and fixated. So I'm not saying you shouldn't standardize tasks, you shouldn't do it, but you should also allow people to an element of flexibility, a bit of a personality in terms of what they're, in terms of what they're doing. Another kind of myth, I think, is that you have to find the perfect job or create the perfect job for someone that doesn't happen. In reality, what happens is that you create and develop and evolve these roles yourself. So it's people who report having really satisfied careers and jobs are the ones that feel that they've had the opportunity to kind of develop and grow those for themselves. And then lastly, just to leave with this with is that we shouldn't be treating individuality as a threat but we should be embracing it as a competitive and compassionate advantage. We're all come in different shapes and sizes. And rather than just leaving personalization to our cups of coffee, we should be bringing it to the work and the workplace and the work that we do. So I'd like to finish on that aspect and we can take some questions if people have them. Um, but thank you very much for your time and your energy and your um, opportunity to speak to you today. So thank you, thank you so much. Thanks very much, Rob. Really enjoyed that. Um, feel free to drop your questions in the chat, guys, and I'll ask them uh, to Rob. I actually have a couple myself, Rob. Um, so yeah. I mean, first thing I just want to say, I, I love the stories about that, um, you know, the cleaning crew and also the, on the yeah. airline. You know, often you can look at certain roles and think that because they're quite repetitive, that it would yes. be hard to personalise them. And it's great to see that example and really, um, yeah, any, any role can be personalised, basically. So I really like that. Um, I know that we, we, we try from a, an output in our business to try and focus on financial clarity for our clients rather than just simply going, oh, we're just doing doing this for the sake of doing this. You know, that's why the data becomes such an important part of what we do. Yeah. Um, but it's a balancing act, isn't it? It's quite high, you know, this balanced, it's always, it's never quite um, plain sailing in that respect. Um, so the question I have is around, you know, obviously you're, this is very much looking at it from a personal perspective. Yeah. And potentially there's a, there's a way of kind of encouraging and positively increasing personalization at work within our yeah. team. But I suppose it highlighted to me, like what happens if somebody has personalized their work in a way that um, they've done it, maybe they've been doing it for a long time yeah. and change needs to occur. And yeah. like how, how as a business owner can you approach that? Because I'm assuming there's going to be a hell of a lot of sensitivity required in that. 
um, particularly if you know, somebody's been doing something for 15 years and have created that personalization themselves. Yeah, no, I think there's a really interesting point. I think the, 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 the purpose is really to create the space and the opportunities and the invitation for people to do it. But my, my mantra, and I think within business, and we can't argue with the last 12 months, is the fact that if someone hasn't evolved their job, so if they haven't evolved how they do things or the business hasn't changed their job, then either the business has failed that individual or that individual has failed the business in some way. It, you, things can't stay still, like in terms of it's, if you're going to develop. So it, that's a kind of like a given. But the way that I think job crafting is, is, is a positive approach is that it invites people to say, actually, what are the things that you'd, rather than me telling you what, how you should change your job, and there may be an element of this, is actually what are the things that would you like to, to, to do for yourself? And often when you're encouraging people to craft their job in a responsible, positive way, I get people to think about how's this going to impact on you? How's it going to impact on your colleagues? And how's it going to impact on the business? So that it's saying that when you're crafting, you can't just stop using a process or a system, say using a CMS system that many of us have to do. I hate doing CMS systems, like keeping those things up to date. Yeah, I know that my colleagues can't do their job properly if I don't update it. So I can't just say I'm not going to do it as my job crafting. I'm going to just, you know, because I know that it impacts on my colleagues and my business. So there's no way I can do that. Yet yeah, maybe I can think about doing it in a framing when I do it. So I do it first thing in the morning for 15 minutes, to, you know, try and do it playfully rather than yeah. just ignoring it and letting it fester. So I think it's, it's, it's getting people to think about how they can do it in ways that support themselves, their colleagues in the business, but also then just having it as an open invitation to, 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 to do it as well. Cool. Thanks very much.